Becoming Who You Are podcast, your guide to authentic living. Visit becomingwhoyouare.net for more resources, tools, and suggestions designed to help you create the life you want from the inside out. Now here's your host, Hannah. Hello, lovely listeners, and welcome to the Becoming Who You Are podcast. My name is Hannah, and today I wanted to share an article with you that I've been storing up for the past few months. If you listen to the show on a regular basis or you subscribe to it, you'll have noticed that I haven't done an episode for a while, and that's because I've been traveling around South and Central America, and it's been a little bit difficult to find a good place to do a podcast where it's not noisy and I have some privacy and I can make a semi-decent recording. So at the moment, I'm in Merida, which is a city in Mexico, a lovely city that I highly recommend visiting if you're ever in this part of the world. And I'm here for about a month, so hopefully I'll be able to get a few episodes down now and um, start posting semi-regularly again. So the article that I wanted to share with you today is about marriage, but I think the content can apply pretty much to all romantic relationships, whether you're married, living together, dating, or whatever situation you're in with a relationship. What I really liked about this article is that it deconstructs several common myths we hear talked about to do with the relationship, but it does so in a really constructive way. Many of us are brought up with a lot of very skewed beliefs and expectations about how relationships should work, and this article provides a healthy dose of reality. I also like the fact that the way the author deconstructs these myths in some ways really takes the pressure off. And I think you'll see what I mean as I'm reading the article. So this was featured in Psychology Today. I can't find the exact date on the article, but it was published at some point in August last year. I said I've been storing it up for a few months and I was right. And it was written by Susan Heitler, PhD. A little bit about Susan before I begin. A graduate of Harvard and NYU, Susan is author of the Marriage Skills books, The Power of Two and The Power of Two Workbook, and of the interactive online marriage skills program based on her books, powerofteamarriage.com. So this is the article. Marriage, the loving partnership of two people, easily fits the words that the author Charles Dickens once famously penned in his book, A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven, we were all going direct the other way. Most couples feel positive about their relationship when they first wed. Over time, however, familiarity can breed contempt. Many seemingly well-matched and well-intentioned couples find their matrimonial bliss becoming increasingly tarnished. How does a dream marriage turn into a nightmare? The reality is that the first stage of love, the honeymoon phase, folks focus on what they find attractive about each other. Later comes stage two, when spouses begin to address the areas of difference, the his way, her way issues. At this point, and again at any point in the relationship where the couple faces difficult challenges, heeding conventional wisdom, alas, can undermine a potentially excellent marriage partnership. Here's some words of wisdom, i.e. matrimonial myths, about which it's an especially good idea to wise up. Number one, marriage is about compromise. Heaven forbid, compromise is lose-lose decision-making. If I want to live in Florida and you want to live in Seattle, we'll both be unhappy in Ohio. Aim instead for win-win solutions. If you don't already know the art of win-win decision-making, that's a skill well worth a few hours of your time to learn. In addition to the link in the prior sentence, which is in the article but unfortunately not in this podcast, I have multiple posts on my PT blog on skills for making win-win decisions together that both partners will feel good about. There's further info and practice options in my Power of Two workbook and on my website, powerofteamarriage.com. And just as an aside, that is Susan Heitler's website that I mentioned earlier. Number two, spouses need to get their anger out. 
Yes and no. If you're mad, no doubt there's something real that you need to discuss. The key word here though is discuss. Anger is a stop sign. That means that when you feel angry or hear your partner becoming angry, stop the conversation. Take a cool down break, either by momentarily changing the topic to a cooler issue or by briefly going out of the room to get a cooling drink of water. No one wants to feel the other is walking out on him, so be sure that the two of you map out a plan ahead of time. That way, any time either of your tempers begin to rise, you both each will rise up on your legs, walk in an opposite direction, cool down, and then return for a fresh start on the discussion. Once your anger has drained, it's easier to take a calmer perspective on the problem. You'll both listen better to your partner's perspective. Without anger or defensiveness, you'll be able to figure out what your concerns are, to hear your partners, and to respond to both with a plan of action that solves the problem. If you don't treat anger as a stop sign, addressing challenging situations via anger instead of stopping at best results in domination, that is, enforcing your partner to do it your way, that means you may win the battle, but you'll lose the matrimonial war. And it has potential to cause serious emotional and relationship injuries along the way. Want a depressed spouse? A resentful spouse? Get mad instead of getting smart. Interestingly, like sexual feelings, angry feelings tend to intensify the more you act on them. The more you shout, the more you'll shout, possibly continuing to escalate until you are flooded, at which point you may explode with a full raging anger orgasm. On the flip side, smothering anger is also a risky strategy. Smothering anger invites an eventual outburst of rage. Smother, smolder, smother, explode. The better strategy when you're angry is to stop. Calm down enough to discuss the problem together quietly and find solutions. Number three, intimacy requires being open, communicating what you feel. Yes, communication in marriage is vitally important. At the same time, all matrimonial communication is not equal. Effective communication enhances intimacy. Hurtful communication invites negative emotions, resentment, and distancing. Hurtful communications are usually either critical or controlling. Here's some examples. Critical. I don't like how hot our bedroom gets at night. Controlling. I would like you to keep the window open. Effective. I would like to find a way to cool off our bedroom at night. How would you feel about my opening the windows all the way so that we get more of a breeze in our room? The differences between these three ways of raising an issue may look very subtle, but the reality is that your gut can immediately feel the difference if they're said to you. Critical. Any formulation of the problem that has the word not, including in contraction forms such as I don't like or I wish you wouldn't. Tone of a comment can also convey criticism. Even without the word not, a critical or worse sarcastic tone of voice that conveys you're not okay is likely to invite defensiveness or counterattacks instead of empathy and understanding. Controlling. Any formulation that is telling the other person what you want them to do, I would like you to, is controlling. I would like to, is informative. Controlling comments invite resistance. Effective. Flip your don't likes to would likes. Flip what you would want your partner to do, e.g. I would like you to, to what you might self, what you yourself, sorry, might do differently. I would like to. To further increase your odds of successful dialogue, be sure to invite your partner to share his, her perspective. Asking open-ended how or what questions minds the most data. How would you feel about? What's your thoughts on X, Y, Z? Now you're on your way to collaborative problem solving about the tough spots in your partnership. One additional note on open communication. Intimacy does thrive when couples communicate openly about what they feel when the feelings are positive. As I write in my posts on sending out good vibes and on gratitude in marriage, there are links in the article at this point, the more agreement, appreciation and fun you share, the happier you will feel in your relationships. Number four. Father knows best, brackets, or mother. An I'm right, you're wrong attitude will block you from listening to your partner's perspective. 
The reality of marriage is that there's two of you and both viewpoints need to count. The belief that you know best can tempt you to dismiss your partner's viewpoints. That's a recipe for matrimonial disaster. Insistence on your way or the highway can put you on the fast road to divorce. In fact, as marriage researcher John Gottman has concluded from his studies, an attitude of contempt for your partner's views is one of the best predictors of marriage failure. Instead of insisting that you're right, assume that you're both sensible and intelligent people. That's part of why you chose each other. So listen for what's right, what makes sense, instead of what's wrong with what your partner tells you. Add your partner's views to your own, and the odds zoom up that you'll succeed in travelling together the road to an ever more loving partnership. Number five, don't go to bed mad. Actually, it's far better to go to bed mad than to stay up late with fights. Arguments escalate the more fatigued you both become. So instead of continuing to talk once the nighttime conversation is turning negative, head for the pillows, get a good night's sleep. The problem will still be there in the morning, but with rest, it's easier to talk calmly, listen openly to each other's concerns, feel generously responsive to each other, and find creative solutions. Number six, if you're arguing with me, you must not like me. Yes, when people are arguing, they experience a surge in negative feelings towards each other at the time of the argument. Lots of arguing makes for an overall less satisfying marriage and can have a corrosive impact on love. But does arguing mean dislike? A matrimonial mismatch? No. Arguing indicates skill deficits. Arguing is usually learned in your family of origin. If your folks fought or if you grew up in a single parent family with parent kid fighting, doing what comes naturally is likely to be doing what you observed and did growing up. Arguing, therefore, does not mean that you don't love each other. Arguing does not mean that the two of you are not a good match. It means that you better upgrade your anger management, partner communication and shared decision making skills. Matrimonial partnership is a high skilled activity. Every couple has their differences, just like every ski slope has bumps and icy spots. If you're fighting, that's like falling on a ski slope. It means you've had a skill glitch. In the next paragraph, Dr. Heitler posts some articles that relate to topics like how to talk without criticism, collaborative dialogue, making decisions together collaboratively instead of compromising or fighting, effective apologies, and so on. Um, and if you're interested in those, you can take a look at the article, which is in the show notes. Number seven, marriage is forever. My work as a clinical psychologist specializing in helping folks with serious matrimonial difficulties has taught me about the limits to marriage vows. Like a business contract, a marriage contract can be terminated. Most folks who come to my office end up with highly successful marriages. The marriages that end up instead with divorce usually are because the spouse is persisting in one or more of three deal-breaking behaviors. I call these the three A's alcoholism or any addiction, affairs and or excessive anger with verbal or physical abuse. Can a marriage survive an affair, abuse of anger or an addiction? If a spouse has had a problem with one or more of these three A's, the problem can be fixed if he or she admits the problem and makes serious changes. The marriage can then end up becoming a fine partnership. Without major commitment and real change, however, the three A's are deal breakers that invite marital termination. Number eight, love conquers all. Alas, not so. Follow the mistaken conventional wisdoms above and your marriage ship can spring serious leaks. For smooth sailing in a truly forever relationship, stay savvy, savor your love and make sure that you learn the skills for sustaining a strong and loving marriage. So that was the article and I would love to hear what you think. Do you agree with this advice? And do you have any extra dangerously wrong conventional wisdoms that you'd add to the list? Send me an email at hannah, that's H-A-N-N-A-H, at becomingwhoyouare.net and let me know your feedback, thoughts, comments, suggestions, or head over to www.becomingwhoyouare.net where you can read more about authentic living and contact me through the site. 
Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to talking to you again very soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Becoming Who You Are podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes and leave a review. You can get in touch with Hannah by emailing H-A-N-N-A-H at becomingwhoyouare.net. Don't forget to visit becomingwhoyouare.net and find out how you can use rational personal development to live an authentic life.